Welcome to the Tennessee Achieves Virtual Community Service Webinar. These webinars are designed to provide you, Tennessee Promise students, with an opportunity to learn more about college success tips, careers in your potential field of study, and other topics we think you will find interesting while you are navigating your educational journey. These webinars will also help you complete your community service requirement while it may be difficult for you to do so at this time. A few housekeeping details before we get started. By logging in as a Tennessee Achieve student, we are able to track your attendance and how long you remain actively engaged during the webinar. Once you complete the webinar, you will automatically be given credit for one hour of community service. We will track how long you watch, and if you do not watch the webinar in its entirety, you will not receive credit. You do not need to complete the community service form for these webinars. Tennessee Achieves will log your hours for you. Tennessee Achieves staff and partners across the state are providing important insight and information we think you will find entertaining and informative. We hope you enjoy this new series of webinars. Welcome to the Tennessee Achieves Virtual Community Service Webinar Series, where today we are discussing careers in law enforcement. I'm Graham Thomas at Tennessee Achieves, and we are glad that you have joined us today to learn more about this topic. We've got a really good panel today with a lot of experience. Um, we have Carolyn Smith, who is the Deputy Attorney General, Office of the Tennessee Attorney General, um, and David Roush, who is the Director of the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. I want to thank you guys both for being here today. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, um, just to kick things off, um, uh, General Smith, why don't we start with you? Um, tell us just a little bit about yourself, your background, where you're from. Um, where you went to college, you guys may have been to more than one college. Um, so where you went to college, degrees you've earned, and a little bit about your career. Sure. Um, I grew up in upstate New York and um, about three hours north of the city. And then I attended college in Connecticut at a small private liberal arts school. And I was there for four years. I earned a Bachelor of Arts degrees in psychology and government. Um, it never really had a plan as to what I was going to do after that, but decided um, the job, uh, getting a job was a little scary, so I decided to continue going to school, and I went to the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. So after three years, I graduated there and um, was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, and you know, in order to practice law, you have to pass uh, a pretty difficult bar exam. And I loved being in Pittsburgh, but thought it might be time to try a new place. Uh, so I moved to Nashville and started here. Um, so I did take the bar exam and got licensed. Um, I was worked at some private law firms for about four or five years before joining uh, the state attorney general's office. Uh, and I worked there for six years. I um, I left and went to the Tennessee Alcoholic Beverage Commission where I was the assistant director for about six years and then came back to the attorney general's office where I where I am now. Great, thank you so much for sharing a little bit about that. Director Roush, you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky is where I was born and raised and uh, uh, spent most of uh, my Early years there, I uh, went to uh, my first introduction into college was at a junior college, a community college uh, at Jefferson Community College in, uh, in Louisville and uh, went there for two years uh, and then uh, uh, transferred over to the University of Louisville where I earned my bachelor's degree in political science. And then uh, after leaving uh, uh, the University of Louisville, I went to the U.S. Army. Uh, where I actually started my career in law enforcement. I went to the uh, military police corps in the Army. I spent uh, four years uh, at the MP Corps, and uh, and then after completing that tour of service, I uh, went back to the University of Louisville uh, to earn my uh, master's degree in uh, administration of justice. Um, finished there uh, with the coursework. Uh, prior to getting my degree conferred, I actually started working uh, hunted, went, went hunting for work and found a, a job with the uh, Knoxville Police Department in Knoxville, Tennessee. And so I, I started there, spent uh, spent a career there actually in Knoxville, 25 years, uh, working my way up through the ranks, ultimately to becoming the chief of police in 2011. Uh, spent seven years in that position uh, before retiring from there. Uh, retired because 
uh, I had applied for this job that I'm in now that's the uh, director of the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, uh, and I uh, applied for this job, and uh, the governor selected me in 2018, and I've, uh, I've been in this position uh, since then. Great. Well, thank you both so much for sharing a little bit about that. Um, General Smith, why did you decide to go in into this career path? You talked a little bit about um, while you were in college, you maybe didn't necessarily know exactly what you wanted to do or what your career path might look like. Um, what was the draw? What led you to pursue a career um, in law enforcement? Well, um, it's been a bit, a little bit random for me. And, and so when I worked in the private law firms, um, you know, one thing that's very important when you're working in, in the private sector is billing hours. Um, and one thing that I enjoyed was working with people and working in a collaborative way. And that's something that's a little bit more difficult in the private sector uh, when you're in law. And so I applied for a job at the attorney general's office. And I think a lot of times when people hear the words law enforcement, they think of criminal law enforcement. And that's that's not what I have been involved in. Um, there's about 16 different divisions in the attorney general's office. And just to clarify, we're different. The district attorney generals work at the uh, county level and they are prosecuting um, crimes. Mm -hmm. um, so I work on the civil law side, but the attorney general's office has about 16 divisions and they do a lot of different types of work. Um, part of it is representing and defending state agencies and departments in lawsuits. Um, part of it is civil law enforcement that includes uh, the work that I did when I was in the consumer protection division. So um, in consumer protection, we are looking at unfair or deceptive acts or practices, and we are, we are conducting investigations and filing lawsuits um, against people or businesses that are that are violating the law. Just to give you an idea of what that might be, I was involved in a lot of different cases, but um, you know, right now the office is involved in an, uh, some lawsuits against opioid manufacturers because we the state alleged that they made you know false claims to people about um, the risks associated with uh, prescription opioids was involved in a case um, with um, filing a lawsuit against a hormone replacement company when they were telling people things like, um, you know, it was completely safe and there, were, there was no danger, no side effects, and, and that wasn't true. So um, it's the civil side of law enforcement that my office works on primarily. We do have a criminal appeals division where they get involved at the appellate level, um, which you see on TV. It, you know, in, in crime shows, typically you see district attorneys prosecuting cases going to trial. And when those decisions are appealed, meaning they go to a higher court that's going to going to kind of review the case. Um, it's, it's there's not another trial. It's not calling witnesses. It's looking at the record. But those appellate cases are what my office is involved in. That's one of the ways that we're involved in, in criminal law enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, so when I got my job at the attorney general's office, I was put in the consumer protection division. So that's pretty much where my my civil law enforcement career started. Uh, but like I said, it was it was somewhat random because, frankly, I didn't even know that that work was going on at the time. Sure. Um, Director Roush, it sounds like you maybe had a better idea that this was what you wanted to do from the beginning um, as you were going through college and starting your career. Um, what led you into this field? So um, I, I think early on, uh, you're right. I, I did kind of have this this mindset of what I wanted to to do. I um, it, it really came from watching uh, those in the profession uh, as I was young, and you know it's interesting. You know, every every child either wants to be a fireman or a policeman uh, early on, and uh, and and then you know the, you kind of adjust. I think is the way it works. But I I never adjusted, so I still kind of focused on that and uh, really respected uh, what what law enforcement was about, and uh, just just watched that as I was as, as I was growing up, and um, it, it just I guess where it really solidified it was. Uh, was interactions I had with uh, positive interactions with law enforcement, and uh, just I, I was always very enamored uh, by them, and and uh, 
and and I'm from a family that's a family of service. Our our family, uh, half of us uh, were in the U.S. Army or the the Navy. So, um, so so I was from a family of service. But I I wanted to really engage in this law enforcement side of the house. So uh, that's that's really what led me to the to the area that I went in. And uh, not everybody picks their career that early, but uh, but I, I did. I just thought it would be the uh, the the field that uh, would fulfill what I was really looking to to become involved in, and so um, w- was fortunate, uh, obviously, to to get the opportunity in, in Knoxville, and uh, that's the traditional law enforcement field. It's uh, where you go in and you start out at the bottom. Uh, you, you start out as a recruit in the academy. You learn all you can about uh, policing, and modern day policing is much different uh, than than the history of our, our profession. And so you, you, you had, there are a lot of skills you need to learn. And, uh, I think my experience prior to that helped me tremendously. My experience in, uh, both in, in college, as well as my time in the, uh, military gave me a, a, a kind of a leg up, uh, if you will, in the, uh, in the effort, uh, as I entered the police department, um, in Knoxville. And so, but it was, it was interesting because it's, it's traditional. And when I say traditional policing, it is, uh, the, the police officer in the patrol car on the beat answering calls, uh, you know, doing everything you can to, to help people, uh, in the community, uh, in that role. And, uh, you know, it's, it's that safe, uh, that peacekeeper role and keeping people safe and being a guardian and, we, we in law enforcement like to equate it to really kind of, if you think about it, the police officers are the sheepdogs of community, right? They're the ones that keep uh, the wolves away from sheep, um, you know, and, and, and not anything derogatory toward anyone, but that's, that's keeping the, the bad away from the good. And, uh, and that's the line that law enforcement has is, is protecting. And so uh, that was a role that I embraced and enjoyed and, uh, and, and was able to uh, uh, show some success in and, um, but, but that role of the cop on the beat is the one that I fulfilled for a long time. Even, even I was, as I was promoted through the ranks, I, I continued to uh, work in our patrol division. And so, um, the vast majority of my time was spent doing that. And that's where you have that direct connection with the public. And, uh, you get to see kind of the, the impact of, uh, the work that you do. You, you can, uh, you can see when you help somebody and how they turn out. Uh, as a result of that help that you provide them. So uh, it, it's a very rewarding uh, and fulfilling career. Yeah, I want to kind of touch on something that I think you both mentioned now, like some of that day-to-day stuff. And um, Director Roush, we can stay with you to start this one. But, um, you know, I think people think, or you know, I think TBI and I think, um, you know, like the fugitive, Tommy Lee Jones and Harrison Ford and the manhunts and, you know, all the stuff that we see on TV um, about, or that we see in movies, but what is your day to day really like? Um, what is really kind of going on that we're not seeing that doesn't make headlines that when you're not doing press conferences and things like that? Right. So, so TBI is an interesting organization, much different than the traditional that I was just talking about. So TBI is, is the state's investigative arm. Um, and what that means is there are uh, there are 31, as was mentioned by the general. There are there are 31 district attorney generals in our state, and so they they serve as the chief law enforcement officer for each of our districts. And what they do is they will call the TBI in uh, to assist in investigative cases where they may be they, they may need uh, specific expertise. Uh, or there is a, a specific need for an outside independent agency to come in. So the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation is an independent investigative agency. And so we would come in and do those investigations. We have a number of cases that are, are types of crimes that we investigate by statute that the law uh, directly gives us original jurisdiction over. And then there are those that we have to be called in by the DA to work. And so, uh, so the primary function of the TBI is investigations. And, um, and, and a lot of what you see on TV shows is, uh, is similar to what we do. We come in and we assist and we, we, we use the, the tactics and techniques that our agents, um, uh, do very well in, uh, in determining who's committed a crime after a crime has been committed. 
Uh, and so that's, that's a big piece of what we do, but some of the behind the scenes things that are interesting, of course, we run the state crime labs. Uh, so we all evidence, uh, it comes into our office and is analyzed by our scientists, our forensic scientists. And so, and there are many disciplines, everything from, uh, DNA to, uh, fingerprinting to, uh, firearms, ballistics, uh, you name it, we, we have the, uh, the different techniques, drug testing, all of that happens in our science, in our labs. Uh, and we have three labs uh, in the state. We have one in Memphis, one in Knoxville, and one in here in Nashville. And so the, the labs are another area that we, uh, that we have a lot of effort and, and work going on there. And then, uh, and then there's another component uh, that's kind of the quiet component, and that is our records management side of the house. So we, we hold the TBI houses all law enforcement records for the state of Tennessee. And so what that means is when somebody files a police report, it comes here to the TBI. Uh, we have every report that's, that's made in the state. Uh, if someone is arrested, it comes here to the TBI. Uh, uh, citation data, if someone's written a citation, it comes here. So we have all of those records that we house here. So a lot of information and data that we house that we utilize to help uh, the entire state in addressing criminal activity and uh, and safety in general for the state, and that that data is compiled and put out in reports annually uh, for our residents and for the different organizations in the state that use crime data uh, and, and information. And so that's another interesting side of the house that most people aren't aware that we are involved in. Um, and then the the other piece is uh, uh, firearms and background sales, right? So backgrounds. Uh, for someone who wants to purchase a firearm, all come through TBI. We have to check to make sure that, that someone's authorized and legal to uh, to purchase a firearm. Uh, their background, if they want to have a handgun permit, we we run those to make sure that they're legal to carry a firearm. And then there are also backgrounds that are done on other areas, like uh, teachers, for example. In order to be a teacher, you have to have a background, and we do those backgrounds. Uh, work in a daycare, we do those backgrounds, and various other professions. When there's a background required, the, the Bureau does those backgrounds. And so uh, that's another piece that we do. It's all about the safety of, of our communities. And so what I, what I have learned here at the Bureau is that we, we are the agency where all uh, criminal justice starts and ends. Because on the other end of it is if someone's record is to be uh, diverted or expunged, that also comes through the Bureau. So we would be the ones who would clear their record if a court ordered source. So it's uh, it's an interesting organization that has a lot of different things going on. Yes, sir. A lot of moving parts that you certainly don't see in the movies and on TV. Um, General Smith, you talked a little bit about some of the things that you might see on TV or in a movie versus the reality of your job. What are some of those misconceptions, misperceptions about your job? Um, and what does kind of your day-to-day -day look like? Um. So currently, I am the Deputy Attorney General of the Education and Employment Division, um, and that started in February. But before that, I spent a significant amount of time in the Consumer Protection Division, and that's what I'm going to talk about because that's that's law enforcement. That's where we're trying to go out and enforce laws as opposed to defending lawsuits that are filed against the state. Um, the one thing that, that a lot of TV shows suggest is that cases move really fast, <laughs> um, often in an hour on TV. Um, so, you know, realistically, things are a lot slower than that. But day to day in consumer protection, um, you know, we have ongoing cases that have been filed in court. And um, it's a lot of reviewing documents, gathering evidence. You know, in our office, there are, of course, a lot of attorneys, but there's also uh, we have paralegals, we have investigators, we have support staff. So a lot of people working together to put a case together, going out, interviewing witnesses, um, looking at documents that people produce, collecting other types of evidence and information, you know, off, off, the, um, off the web uh, from witnesses, from victims. Um, a lot of times we work with other state agencies or departments. Um, in the opioid litigation that I mentioned, when we worked on that, the manufacturers wanted to take depositions of a number of people within state government, including people at, um, at TBI, 
Um, so it's, you know, it's working with other people throughout state government to prepare them for things. And, and I should mention a deposition is basically a formal procedure for asking a lot of questions of, of a witness or someone who has filed a lawsuit or you have filed a lawsuit against where you ask them a number of questions to find out information and it's all recorded by a court reporter so that you can use it in your case. Um, Sometimes, you know, there will be hearings in court or trials. Um, and then before a case is actually brought and something is filed in court, there's a lot of work that goes into investigating what's going on. You know, obviously, you have to have a lot of information and facts to be able to bring a lawsuit and claim that somebody is violating the law. So uh, in Tennessee, there is a Division of Consumer Affairs, which is actually in the attorney general's office right now but they take consumer complaints. So when a consumer um, complains about something that happened to them, they were you know, a, a victim of some deceptive conduct or they were um, a more realistic example, maybe you know, they were sold something and they, they paid the money and they never got it, or they, would, they were told they were getting something that um, you know, could do X, Y, and Z. They get the product and it can't. So we're reviewing a lot of complaints, figuring out where our resources are best spent in trying to enforce the law. So a lot of the work is in the office, going through um, going through paperwork, trying to find information that will help us. But a lot of it's also going out in the field, sending investigators to talk to people, to find people, uh, and then going to court. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about some of the, the soft skills that are needed in your job. I imagine that there is... Um, a lot of research involved. That's something that we've heard from several of our panelists on some of these other webinars is how important research is, but just some of the soft skills in general. Um, can you talk a little bit about research and why it's important and then any other soft skills that you think are important? Sure. There's there's sort of, you know, for lawyers, there's traditional legal research where you're looking at um, opinions in cases that, that courts have written so, uh, and you're looking at the laws to research what the laws actually say. Um, but then there's other research where when we're trying to build a case, we're trying to find out who are the witnesses. We're talking to people and say, who knows what happened here? Who are the victims? What, what were they told? What did they, what did they lose? How were they victimized? Um, you know, Google is a great asset when you're trying to, to find things because um, it's amazing what people put online and the record stays around for a long time. Um, so a lot of the research maybe isn't, you know, technical, legal or traditional legal research, but it's out there and finding what information can we gather. And a lot of times you're trying to think outside the box. Where can I find this information? Is there another state agency or a local agency or federal that have some information that might help me? So sometimes you have to be a little creative in where you think you might be able to find information, which means that it's a really good skill to be able to work with people um, to be able to call people who've never heard from you before and have a discussion and try to find out information from them. Um, so you, so you, you really need to be able to um, be creative, to reach out to other sources and try to get them to help you. Um, and it, it's just a, it's a very valuable skill because I think, it, it, you know, you can sort of imagine that if somebody called you out of the blue and said, hey, I need this information from you, give it to me. Well, that doesn't really elicit um, a great response, probably, because I'm going to say, well, who are you? I don't need to help you. Goodbye. But if you can call someone and explain to them what you're doing, what you need, could they please help you? Uh, figure out the best way to approach them to get what you need. And, and that, that's a really important skill. Yeah. Director Rouse, I'll ask you this. And General Smith, feel free to kind of pipe in. Um, it, Definitely plays on what you were talking about, but I imagine that um, having a strong interpersonal communication skills in your line of work is very important. I, I know probably when people are communicating and working with the police, they're oftentimes probably a little nervous, a little scared. Um, why is that important? Any other soft skills that are important in your line of work? I, I, absolutely. I was going to just add in there that communication skills are absolutely critical. The, being able to um, utilize all levels of communication, right? So, uh, and being able to read another person. So uh, their behavior and, and their actions based on what you say or 
uh, questions that, that you ask and then the way they answer. And so, so really a great grasp of interpersonal communication is, is absolutely solid for law enforcement. It's, uh, it, it is the, it's the tool that we use to be effective. And so, uh, absolutely communication is, is the skill that I think is probably one of the most important. Um, there are other soft skills, you know, the, uh, the others that we talk about are technology, right? Uh, and fortunately, uh, our young people today are very skilled in learning. Uh, they, they have more skill in the technology realm than any of us. And, and those skills are very important. Uh, crime is becoming more and more technical. Every crime scene now has a technical aspect to it. And so understanding technology is absolutely critical uh, for law enforcement. You know, and when I say that every scene has, has a technology component, if you think about it, uh, cell phones uh, are just many computers and they're, they're present at every, every crime scene. And so it is a way for investigators to get information and glean information uh, is through uh, cell phones. But then you think about what's happened with technology and where we, what we see in things like Alexa, you know, the Echo Dots and all those kind of things. That's another uh, technology area that we have to understand and utilize that information from those. And, uh, you know, I, I get amazed every day at the next level of, you know, technology that we're using to solve crime, things like uh, computer chips and refrigerators. Um, it, it's just amazing when you think about all of the different aspects of technology and how they, how they play into everybody's everyday life. And that becomes part of those skills you need to understand as you do an investigation. And so, um, you know, those are those are key soft skills, um, I think, that are that are critical for for this profession. Yeah, I would echo that, because in, you know, in our office, um, when we're looking for information or evidence, it's always possible that somebody has tried to delete something, tried to destroy something. And it's our job to try to recover it and find it and know where to look. And, you know, if, if I'm trying to gather information, um, yeah, I'm interested in what somebody has on their computer. I'm interested in what they have on their phone. So, you know, being familiar with technology uh, to know where to look for things, to know how to recover it, how to preserve it. And, and a big issue in consumer protection right now is the security and uh, of data personal data and people's privacy. And, you know, now that there is so much information that's collected in online, making sure it's um, in a secure environment, that it's protected. And we hear about data breaches all the time. Um, so, you know, one thing that I do, I, I can't be an expert in every area that I'm looking at because each one is, is almost a full-time job. But you know, one thing that's important for me to know, okay, I, I need to recover these records that are on somebody's cell phone. Who can I call to help me do that? Or, you know, what department might help me? Maybe I can call uh, TBI because of their expertise. Maybe I can call another department who is familiar with how records are kept, where, they, where they're kept, how they're stored. Um, so being able to sort of flag issues and knowing who I can call and ask for help is, is a, also a, a huge benefit to the, the work that we're doing. Yeah, it sounds like teamwork is really important, too, working across state agencies, working with your coworkers, with um, local municipalities, like really quite a, a wide range of stakeholders. That's exactly true. Director yeah, I'll I'll echo that. Te yeah, teamwork is, is critical. Uh, we we couldn't we couldn't accomplish anything uh, without it. Yeah, that's something we're hearing from a lot of our panelists as well. Um, Director, I'll talk to you, or I guess maybe talk to us a little bit about in your career. You've worked for a large state agency. You've worked in local law enforcement, and then your time with the Army, which I'll be honest with you, something I know very little about. But um, what is kind of what are the differences in those? What are the similarities? What are things you've taken away from each of those? So, um, I, of course, I'll start at the kind of the front end and work my way up. So it, my, my experience in the U.S. Army was uh, was interesting because it, there there are kind of two roles that law enforcement play in the military. So you have the uh, what they call the garrison role and the garrison role is kind of the traditional law enforcement where you are doing police work 
on a, a military installation and so on a post and you're you do everything that a law enforcement officer in a community does you you know you you do security checks you you uh you do traffic enforcement uh you answer calls for service and so uh it's very traditional the other aspect of that is a combat role uh in policing and the combat role in policing is things like um uh, creating uh, uh protection uh, for supply routes. Uh, you also, you, you do enemy prisoner of war processing and uh, you learn how to secure command posts. And so there, there are that, that aspect of it for the military side of the house. And, um, and there are also, there's a corrections piece to the military side of the house. And so uh, I worked a little bit in the corrections side of the house doing uh, investigations uh, at the uh, at the disciplinary facilities, and so uh, very very interesting different mixes on the law enforcement side in in the military. Then go to to uh, local law enforcement, where I worked for the city of Knoxville. Um, very different, you know. Again, your your skill sets there are you're interacting with the public, you're building community uh, trust, uh, and you're you're working to keep the community safe and. Uh, I worked in various aspects there. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the local law enforcement primarily does, uh, you know, all of the safety uh, efforts to keep a, a, a city or a county safe um, and enforcing those laws and assuring, upholding the rule of law uh, for, our, for our communities. Um, and, and there's a compassion side to that as well. I don't think people really recognize that. Uh, police officers aren't all just going out there hunting for somebody to put in jail or to write a ticket to. They they're actually out there compassionately trying to care for our communities and and keeping our communities safe and uh, and doing all, all that entails. That's working with our our nonprofits in the in communities where you know the homeless side of the house or uh, for youth services and uh, trying to make sure that the least of these is what we always called it had what they needed to be. Uh, to be protected. And so uh, there's that compassion side with local law enforcement. And then when you move where I'm now in the state level, uh, we, we have a different approach and different uh, responsibility, quite frankly, for uh, the safety of all of our residents in the state. And, and it is really just to assure uh, we have a motto and we follow that motto very closely. And that is that guilt shall not escape nor innocence suffer. And so that that really kind of explains what the bureau does. We we go after those who have committed crimes um, in our state that are that are heinous, um, but we also want to protect those who are innocent and uh, not to uh, hold them accountable for things that are they're not accountable for. So uh, that's that's a lot of what our lab does is they try to determine if a person is or is not uh, the person we need to look at. And so that's 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 the differences. Um, in this, in the the different pieces that I've been involved in. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for uh, kind of providing that summary. It's definitely a lot of similarities, a lot of differences, and um, that military side of things is not one we probably see so much as the other two. So I appreciate you sh- providing that insight, um, General Smith. What would you, what advice do you have for a student that may want to follow in your career path? Um, and for students that are graduating in the next, um, you know, couple of years, what opportunities exist for them? So, um, you know, if people are thinking about go- the possibility of going to law school, um, there's not really any particular major that they have to have or classes that they have to take to get into law school. The important thing in law school is really critical thinking and being able to write well. You know, if, if you're going to go to medical school or some other type of graduate school, it may be that there are very specific classes you're required to take. Or chances are, if you're an English major, you're not going to go to, to medical school. Um, but there are all sorts of studies that people um, this that people do before going to law school. So, like I said, it, it, it's very important to be able to critically think and to write well, to communicate well. So. Um, in other words, you don't have to sort of pigeonhole yourself in what you're studying in college to be able to get to law school. Uh, there are also a lot of other law related careers. If, if you think maybe law school is not for you, you know, um, there are great paralegal jobs, either in the public sector or the private sector, where you're doing a lot of work 
to support lawyers, um, but you're doing things like, you know, drafting documents, you're interviewing witnesses, you're putting things together for a lawyer um, that can be very interesting and very rewarding, working one-on-one with a lot of, you know, the people who are affected directly uh, with some kind of legal issue. Um, And then there's also, you know, the investigators we have in our office. So I guess what I'm trying to say is there are a lot of different paths you can take to do something that will get you into the legal field. And, you know, our office uh, employs, I think, about 300 people. Uh, so so it's, a, it's a big office. And, and also there's other legal careers throughout the state. But it's not just, you know, being a lawyer. It's being paralegal, investigator, support staff. There are a lot of, a lot of different options. So um, as people consider college and consider the classes they're going to take, focus, focus on what's going to help you to think, to be creative, to think outside the box, to, you know, analyze um, different positions, to be able to argue something that maybe you don't necessarily agree with. But, um, you know, as a lawyer, I can't always choose what my client's position is, but I have to argue it for them. And I have to be able to do that. So um, those are the kinds of things you need to think about if maybe you want to go into do a, a legal career. Yeah, that's, I think, really good advice. Director Roush, what about you? Um, For students that may want to follow a career path similar to yours, what advice do you have for them and what kind of opportunities will be available for them after they graduate? So there there are great opportunities. So um, law enforcement is a field that, uh, quite frankly, right now, struggling to get uh, uh, to get the, the folks to uh, to come into it. And I think the, the, the biggest challenge is maybe some of the misnomers and the, the misinformation about law enforcement. You know, unfortunately, in the past uh, several years, uh, law enforcement's kind of taken a black eye on some of the uh, the challenges that have been highlighted in, in areas like social media and even some of the traditional media, and uh, basically painting law enforcement with a broad brush that is that is uh, inaccurate. Uh, and so, I think law enforcement has suffered as a result of that. And, uh, and it's unfair because law enforcement is a, uh, is a noble profession. It is a good profession where good people are able to do amazing things to protect our communities. And, um, and so I would t- say, you know, in terms of, of uh, preparing yourself for it is uh, there, are, there are some very key things. Now, uh, in the state of Tennessee, uh, you have to be 21 years of age uh, to, to carry a firearm. And therefore, you 21 years of age to be a law enforcement officer. Uh, that gives you time after high school to get some experience. Uh, go to a community college or go to a, a, a traditional four-year university and get some experience, or uh, or even go to the military uh, to get that that life experience uh, that is critical. And so, gaining those those experiences and skills are important. And there's not a particular area of study. I know a lot of folks think you got to go and study criminal justice. Well, um, that's good, but it's not necessary, right? And so we we actually in law enforcement like to see folks who have various backgrounds. The diversity of thought is what we call it, and that diversity of thought helps because when you when you get a team of law enforcement officers together and you start to work on problems, which is a lot of what we do. Uh, you, you do a lot of problem solving. And so it's good to have different perspectives, people with different understanding and different different knowledge to bring to the table to to really creatively come up with solutions that may not have been thought of before. And so that, that helps tremendously. So we like folks who come in with a different background and in, uh, into law enforcement. And so um, I, I think in terms of, of potential for a career, it's amazing. There's a lot of opportunities. And so, so in law enforcement, we have three levels, right? You have the local, state, federal levels in law enforcement. There's great opportunity uh, for all of them. And so I, I think it's important. I think it's important that uh, young people that are looking at this as a career uh, understand that the key is to have a heart of a servant. That's where your success will come from. Yeah, I really kind of like that part about being, um, you know, visible in the communities that you're serving and kind of having that heart of a servant. You both obviously are uh, mentors with Tennessee Achieve, so you both give back. I know you're both involved in your communities in a lot of different ways. 
Um, whoever would like to go first, feel free to jump in. But why do you think it's important to get back? Um, why is it that you decide to be active in your community? Well, I think um, I think it's really important to kind of share what we know um, because you know it, 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 we have a lot of kind of life experience and knowledge that can that can help students who um, may not you know have another source of getting that type of knowledge. Um, I mean, we're just a different perspective. Um, they can get information from family and uh, from school. But like Director Roush was saying, it's always good to have different perspectives, people with a different background, with different knowledge, bring that to the table to, to let students know how many opportunities are out there. Um, you know, no one person can be, can be aware of, of everything. So we've kind, of, we've kind of been through, we've both been through higher education and a couple of different employment opportunities. So, um, you know, I just think it's important for us to share because, um, you know, we can help kind of students figure out what path they may want to take and also let them know some things maybe we missed along the way and wish we would have known. Yeah, and I would add that um, uh, one is obviously we, we both uh, appreciate the opportunities we've been given and uh, and want to want to pay back, um, pay forward those. I think that's that's critical and important uh, as we as we uh, have been successful and and have had the opportunity and so to to give back in that manner as well and uh, and and I think the other piece is that we that we are we are able to give the perspective to clear up nuances and 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 misunderstandings about uh, what what our our career paths. Uh, entail, you know, the, the, we get that we take that mystery away from it. The more that we get engaged and involved, and and help people see that there's opportunities. You know, I, I, I you know, I, I'm not from a, a, a rich family. I'm from a a, a family of, of, of poor means, and um, and this was my opportunity to uh, to to you know break beyond that. Um, that pattern of, of life that I was in. And so um, to step outside of that and be able to, to make a great life and, uh, and, and it, it was, it's been a fulfilling life, right. And uh, in service to community and, and service to this country and now service to the state. And so I think that's the, that's the, the advantage of us being able to be part of this and, and being able to, to share those experiences with young people to help them see what the potentials are. Director Ralph, were you the first person in your family to go to college? So not the first to go to college, but uh, uh, I was the first to to earn my uh, master's. Um, and so I have my, my oldest brother uh, earned earned a degree, and then uh, and then it then it was a few brothers later uh, that that got another one. So I'm from a very large family. There are ten of us, and so uh, I was number seven. But uh, but I was the first to earn my advanced degree. Uh, in the family. And what's interesting is many of them have now gone on to earn their advanced degrees. And so uh, we all saw, you know, the potential, uh, our parents, you know, that's where, where it started. I mean, they, they told us that we could be anything and do anything we want in life. And, and, you know, the, the reality is they were exactly right. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what means you come from, uh, that if you just have that drive and determination uh, and you, you, you put yourself in positions to where, uh, you're challenged and you're able to show your skills and uh, ultimately people will recognize and good things come. Yeah, I think that's, um, well, thanks for sharing that. That, that was really good. Um, what would you guys, then again, either, either one of you can jump in and, and go first. Um, I mean, Director Ross, you've talked about some of the challenges in your job, but either one of you, um, what would you say is your favorite part of what you get to do every day? Oh gosh, I, I I would tell you the favorite part that what I get to do every day is is to serve people. Um, you know, I, I I tell our folks here at the bureau in leadership, the role of leadership is really simple. It is to assure that our employees have everything they need to be successful, to serve them, and to make sure that their families have what they need. And that's it. If we take care of the employees, the employees will take care of the organization. And so service to me is, is the absolute greatest uh, piece of, of my day. 
Yeah, I would I would echo that. You know, in consumer protection, um, a lot of the the people who are victimized are in vulnerable populations, and it, it might be elderly um, or uh, veterans um, who are targeted by someone who knows exactly what they're doing and they're consciously trying to deceive people in order to make money. I mean, usually it's some kind of a financial loss. We're not we're not enforcing laws for physical injuries. Usually, um, you know, th- things that you might you would see more on the criminal side. But there's there's a lot of financial injury, a lot of emotional injury that goes along with that. And a lot of times, it's things where people um, wouldn't bring a case by themselves. You know, maybe they lost some money, but it wasn't a gigantic amount of money. But you know, just to to go out and find a lawyer and to pursue their case on their own, it's just, it's not feasible for them to do. But, you know, the attorney general's office is able to do that. um, And it's especially effective when there are large groups of people that are affected. And, um, you know, when you, when you get to talk to these people um, who are often very grateful for the work that we're doing, when we're able to recover something for them, they are extremely appreciative. And, um, you know, it, it, it just feels good to be able to do that, that kind of work. And there are a lot of great people in our office that I work with. So I just I enjoy going to work every day, working with great people and, and, and doing good work um, to stop the victimization of, of people around the state. Yeah, that's really great. Well, I appreciate you both kind of sharing your insight into your professions and your careers. Um, we do like to end all of these webinars um, with some questions that are kind of more outside the scope of your specific career. Um, we asked all of our panelists the same three questions in, and I'm going to kind of put the um, first two questions into one. They're kind of similar. Um, General Smith, we can start with you. Um, what's one thing that you know now that you didn't know while you were in college that you wish you knew? And then your one biggest piece of advice for students. I think the one thing I didn't know in college, how many different uh, professions, career paths there are. Um, you know, you think of the obvious ones, doctor, lawyer, uh, accountant, whatever. Um, but there's just an incredible variety of paths that you can take to really meaningful and fulfilling work. And you don't necessarily know about those until either you you find somebody who can tell you about them or you go explore um, you know, the job that I fell into at the attorney general's office was never something that I contemplated. I didn't really know about it at the time. I probably didn't know there was a difference between a district attorney general and the state attorney general. Um, so my, my biggest advice, I think, for students is to take advantage of every opportunity you can. You know, when you're in college, uh, there's a lot of opportunities available to you that you probably won't have at any other time in your life. Um, just different classes you can take, different subjects you can explore, different you know volunteering opportunities that you have time to do. The more people that you can learn from, the more experiences you can have. You know, it opens your eyes to what is available for you out there, and it also really kind of makes you a, a more interesting person who is attractive to employers. Um, the, you know, the breadth of experience you have and knowledge. So, um, you know, I, I tell my kids that, too, and they're I have one child in college, but just take advantage of everything you can, even if it's something you think maybe I'm, you're not interested in. Try it. Make sure you're not interested in it. Just give it a shot. See, see what what happens. Um, so, so that's the biggest piece of advice I have. Yeah, I think that's great. Director Rouse, what about you? Maybe something that you know now that you didn't know while you were in college and then your biggest piece of advice for students. I, I think. The one thing that I that I wished I'd known is the is the advantage of being engaged and involved in the various uh, aspects uh, of of university life. And so things like uh, being engaged in uh, uh, in in the uh, governmental operations, kind of with with the the college. And so you know the student student government organizations and uh, being involved in those type of things, those extracurricular pieces uh, that, that makes you kind of the whole student. I think that's important. I wish that have done more of that because I, I, I really didn't understand that, how important that was um, and, and the skills that you earn uh, when you do that. And so that, that's the one thing I wish that I had known is the impact that those, 
that those groups would have had on my future. And then uh, kind of my piece of advice is, is really, I think, with this generation uh, and generations to come is, is there – uh, is the social media aspect of life is being careful. We're seeing this as we do backgrounds on people who want to come into our profession. Uh, unfortunately, their social media uh, utilization has harmed them because of the way that they've, uh, what they've posted. And, and uh, it's really kind of detrimental uh, to the, to them as well as an organization that might harm. And so being really conscious of what you put out there in the public because it becomes you. Even if it's not true, it becomes you. And so you got to be really careful. And I would, I would caution students to be very, very judicious and conservative in their engagement and involvement on social media. I think that's really good advice. We did an entire webinar on um, one careers in social media, but also do's and don'ts with social media. And I would certainly encourage students, if you haven't watched that one yet, to check that out. Well, a lot of what they talk about is exactly what you just mentioned. So our final question um, that we ask everyone, and Director Roush, we can start with you this time. Um, if you weren't the director at the TBI, um, or if you hadn't pursued a career in law enforcement, if you could do anything, um, and time or money or even skill or talent didn't matter to you, what would you be doing? You know, I, I, I tell folks that ask me, I, I get asked this question, before, believe it or not. And, uh, and, and I just, I, I can't see myself doing anything but being involved in this profession. Um, I really can't. I, I get so much fulfillment out of it. And, and so, you know, I really, this would be what I, this is my dream and, and I'm living it and, and I'm enjoying it. Um, you know, the profession that I'm in, uh, the position really, uh, it, it's, it, it doesn't really matter what position, just as long as I can be engaged and involved in this, in this noble profession because of what it, it, it does. Uh, you know, it, it really is a difference maker. Uh, in our communities. And uh, uh, so I, I really, whatever, whatever it is that I would be, it, it would be in law enforcement. Yeah, I think it's pretty clear that you're very passionate about what you do and, um, and the work that you've done. General Smith, um, what about you? If you could do anything besides work for the Attorney General, what would you be doing? I think that I would like to be a, a teacher of some sort, and I'm not sure what level, but um you know, I think that most people hopefully have had at least one teacher in their life who made a big difference. And I would really like to be the kind of teacher that could make a really big difference in somebody's life, whether it's, you know, being able to teach them something that before then they hadn't been able to understand, or maybe even teach something outside of the classroom, like, you know, how to go about getting into college or possibilities after that. But, um, kind of serving the community in that way, being some type of teacher. Great. Well, that that's a, a really noble profession as well. And I uh, appreciate you both taking the time to hop on um, the webinar with us today and, and talk about your careers and your profession and uh, your journey into this field and sharing your advice and your wisdom with students. You guys are uh, both mentors and have both done a lot for our program. And we really just appreciate everything that you've done for us, but specifically hopping on here today. So thank you so much for hopping on and sharing your expertise with us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. For our students, our audience tuning in today, hang on for just another second. You're going to get some information about how to make sure that this counts towards your community service requirement. But we appreciate you listening in today. Um, I know that I learned a lot listening to our two panels today. I hope that you did as well, um, especially if this is a, a career that you are considering. And we hope that you will listen in to more of our webinar series, our virtual community service webinar series at www.tnachieves.org. Thanks for listening, and we hope you have a great day. Thank you for watching this installment of the Tennessee Achieves Virtual Community Service Webinar. Your attendance will be automatically recorded and your one hour of community service is being credited to you. Please click submit on this screen to ensure that your attendance is recorded for you. For this community service opportunity, you will not need to complete the community service form. We hope you found this opportunity to be engaging and informative. Please watch more of this series by visiting www.tnachieves.org. We hope you have a great day. Thank you.